Everybody hear me? Thank everybody for being here. Can you hear me now? What about now? Jeremy, you going to get that? I'll get, if Robbie's up there. He'll turn me up. What about now? Is that better? Um, thank everybody for being here. Uh, before we get started, got a couple announcements to make. Make sure everybody pays attention to our prayer list out there. I was just talking to Patty. There's some new names out there, so make sure that you're getting a copy of that, praying for those people by name. That's very important. Um, besides that, um, a couple of announcements real quick. Thursday, which is tomorrow, at 3.30, they're going to be delivering all of our lights for the new building. And if anybody can be there to help unload those, that'd be great. I'm looking around. Steve's not in here, but Kevin is. Do you know how many are coming tomorrow? I know there's 79. Um, yeah, it's a couple of pallets. So the more there, we can get them off. About 3.30. 3.30, uh, they're going to try to be here. So if you can be here to help us with that, that'd be great. Um, also, another kind of a situation that we've got. Um, I don't, everybody, do you know um, Don Thomas? He sits usually in the back. He's the barber. Uh, plays and sings sometimes. He's been a barber for about, <clears throat> I think he said about 60 years. And he's always been down at Paul's Barbershop downtown. And uh, the whole roof fell in on the barbershop. And, it's, uh, and they've just let it ruin everything he's got. So she called and he needs to get his chairs out of there. And I'm going to help him Friday morning at 10 o'clock if anybody can help we just need to get his chairs out of there and get them loaded up for him. Uh, he don't have anybody to help him. His family lives, uh, I think, in Florida and maybe Oregon, somewhere like that. So anybody, uh, that's Friday. This Friday, where Paul's Barbershop is down from El Pablito at, at 10 o'clock. He could, he could really use the help. It's, they just, when it fell in, instead of uh, getting it fixed, they just left it open. So it's ruined everything. Uh, but he wants to get those out. And if uh, we can be of a help, I'd certainly like to. Also... Our um, Easter and Resurrection celebration uh, that is coming up. Um, the first thing that we will do, uh, March the 27th, which should be a Saturday. I know it is on my calendar upstairs. <laughs> so it should be, right, March 27th. Um, we're going to have our Easter celebration from 12 to 4 p.m. Now, the way we usually do that is 12 to whenever. But we go into revival the next morning. So um, we want to, it's going to be from 12 to 4. We're going to have hot dogs. We're going to have, um, we're going to have, like we did before, we'll have egg hunts from uh, pre-K all the way. We're even going to do an adult one again this year. So I, I know there's some that enjoyed that. So looking forward to that. That will be March the 27th. Uh, and that is a Saturday. Um, and then on Easter morning, which is April the 4th on our calendar upstairs, and I think it is down here, um, we will have our sunrise service Easter morning at 7 a.m. It's going to be 7 a.m. here. It'll be outside, um, weather permitting. Uh, last year, I know it rained on us, but I stood out there and Steve held an umbrella on, over me. So, um, so I hope you'll make plans to be here for our sunrise service. And then, of course, our, we'll have Sunday school at 9.45 a.m., service at 11, service at 6. I was asked, um, are we having church Easter night? <laughs> Absolutely we are. Yeah, we sure are. Um, so you make plans to be here for all that. As you can see behind me, uh, there is some construction going on. The baptistry, when I was talking about that it had decayed and was in bad shape, take a look at it. It's in the fellowship hall in here. It's the one on the right. It was in pretty bad shape. Um, but I'm thankful to say that in almost 12 years, almost 1,200 people were baptized in that baptistry. So praise the Lord. Amen. I think, it's, I think it's between 1180 and somewhere right in there. So praise the Lord for that. Um, praise the Lord for the crew that is changing this out. It is not an easy task. Um, I, I know that Dale was here late last night. Is Robert in here? 
let me tell you something. Robert has just, man, he worked. I was here last night. Uh, he left about 11. He left before we, I just left a little after him. And he was in here and he was cleaning. They're going to install the new one, try to get started on that tomorrow. And then they'll have to do some uh, sheetrock and things like that. But don't look behind the curtain until it's done. <laughs> uh, I'm not. So uh, they kind of ran me off. I asked if I could help. He said, you can help me by getting away from my tools. And I said, okay. And, um, but it's amazing that just what God's doing here. And it's to see the people that he has sent here. Last Saturday when we were at the building over there working, I was looking around. And I told Risa, I was like, look at these people God sent. We, you know, I mean, we would never be able to get this done without these people that are here. And I wanted Kelly, I, I know that they, uh, Elaine wasn't feeling the best. I don't see Kelly yet, uh, but we were talking Thursday night and just going over some numbers um, from what the architect had said that we were going to have to spend and what we anticipating having to spend over at the new building once we had purchased, uh, they had estimated and we had in our minds it was going to cost us uh, about $1.4 million. Well, after everything that we've gotten done, after if you look at all the stuff that we've got to get done, it's going to cost us about $250,000. Right. You know, that's... That's almost a million dollars in savings. That's, I mean, what, 775000 somewhere right in there. And you know what's funny is when we first went down there to talk to them, that's about what they didn't want to give us. That's how much they didn't want to give us. You know, so we were talking in the meeting and we said, well, you know, God gave them a chance to help us out, but he just showed them he didn't need their money. So <laughs> praise the Lord, man. But hey, let me say this. It's all God. It's nobody else. But there's people in this room who have worked extremely hard over there. There's some sacrificing going on, guys. There's, I mean, there's people over there every day. I can look out and over there every day, and there's, there's youth over there. There's, there's, there's uh, some of our oldest members in the church over there working, not just on Saturdays when everybody else is here. You know, I've gone over to lock up at 9, 930 at night, and there still be people coming in to work. And man, that's, that's what it takes. And, and people have sacrificed for that. So praise the Lord for that. And I can't thank you enough, but it's all glory to God. Amen. <clears throat> Speaking of that, we will be back over there this coming Saturday. And I uh, hope that you can join us. Um, trying to think if I've forgotten anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if you could all hear Dale. Um, he just came to, to help help us. He, he's not been to church here yet. Um, but that's usually how it starts around here. Uh, but he came to help get that out, and it, it fell. It fell on top of him. And uh, he had to get eight stitches, like Dale said. He's got a concussion. Uh, but he can't wait to be back tomorrow to help again. So I, man, it's, that's what God sends us, man. That's, that's what he keeps sending. So it's just amazing what he's doing. But you be praying for him. His name is Mel. So you pray that he'll uh, be okay. But it's, it, that's not an easy job. I, me, and, me and Dale got the same instruction was pretty much to move. Um, and we did. So, uh, but praise the Lord for people who's, who's willing to sacrifice and work. So, with that being said, I'm going, I'm sorry, Renee, go ahead. Uh, we are still going to be feeding the workers. We'll still be feeding the workers every Saturday for lunch. And we will be paying for the Yes, um, and she asked if I would clarify to the, about the workers on the 27th. I want to talk to Steve right after and kind of coordinate the logistics of that. Uh, because they'll probably be like, because we're not going to start until 12, so we may only go until 12 that morning. We don't know yet. And so their food Very well could be. Um, so thank you. But we're going to go ahead and get started, and I'm going to ask if the ushers will come forward. We're gonna, I'm sorry, does somebody have something, Kitty? Somebody have? 
Yes. So anybody bring it with you. Yes. If you've got one and can screw sheet rock, you bring it with you Saturday. Yes, that's right. Saturday's a women's breakfast at Big John's. Yeah, and Renee's speaking. So, yeah, yes. Make plans to be there. Um, and I think that's it. All right. Ushers, if you'll come forward, we'll take up tonight's offering. Yeah, you fill this thing up now, okay? All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you just so much, Lord. Everything we've talked about tonight, Lord God, is just, just we, we give you all the glory. It's, it's nothing we've done. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to serve you. We thank you, God, that you just give us our health to be able uh, to do things for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, Lord, that loves you so much and wants to serve. Father, I I thank you for them being here tonight. I just pray, pray tonight, Father God, that you would uh, search my heart, anything between you and I, Lord, that's not pleasing or hindrance to you, if you'll reveal it to me, Lord, Father, so that I can repent, God. Father, I pray, God, that uh, you would anoint, give me what I stand in need of so that I could uh, properly teach your word, not let me put my ideas or, or, or what I think, but what, only what you think and only what you have me to say. We pray, God, that you would take these tithes and offerings, God, and bless them. Let us use them uh, just specifically as you see fit. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear the sun of God Closes and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we take. None other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and it tells me I am his own And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known, none other has ever known. All right. Thank you, Robbie. Right, we're going to start out. Um, we're going to be in the book of Daniel here in just a few minutes. Daniel chapter 1, but I want, don't, don't stand yet because uh, we're going to start out a little different. I got a question. Um, and, and, and I hope that you'll kind of see why I want to do this. 
Um, if I was to ask in here tonight, how far will you go? What, I, what you say, what do you mean by that? The question that I'm asking is, where do you draw your line? For each man in here, I know that you understand my question. And the response is usually something along the lines of my wife, my kids. You know, I'll, because what I want to get to in a few minutes is the direction that our, our world is going. So my question to you, and it's a true question, I, I've got Robbie who actually has the microphone. And it's not a trick question. It's, it's not anything to call anybody out, but in today's hour, if I was to say, how far are you willing to go? I mean, we hear the argument every day that they're going to get our guns or they're going to do this. Or, but where do you draw the line? Anybody? What's as far as you'll go? Where do you say enough's enough? Where do you say, I have purposed my heart to go no further? Anybody? It's a real question. I'm not trying to trick you. Go, go, let's go one at a time. Uh, old Papa here. I'll go as far as it takes me to go. I will never quit fighting for my Lord and Savior. And when he's ready to take me, I am ready to go. And that's, that's a promise I got in my heart. Because I love the Lord my Savior more than I love anybody else. That's the truth. And you've purposed that in your heart. You have said there's a line in your heart that says, I'm not bending on that. Right? right? Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. Take it to Paul, Robbie. I know you're running back and forth. I'm sorry. But I'm telling you, if... Y'all knew what I put Robbie through. Y'all <laughs> y'all appreciate him. <laughs> well, mine is like he said. I feel like God's in us and got us in control. Wherever we go, we go. Like I told Susan the other week, whatever happens to me happens to me, they're going to be taken care of. But it's like this. They are falling on our church's back. Mm -hmm. And me and Susan had a talk the other day. What can we do? I'd like to know what, what can we do. And I know we can pray, yeah. but there's other stuff that we going to have to stand with one another right. and, and follow God all the way. Well, and, and, and Paul, he, you got Coop? Go head over to Coop. Paul actually answered a question with a question when he said, what do we do? This started a long time with subtle, small changes. That's how we got here. And that's what I want to talk about in just a second. Thank you, Paul. Coop? We had kind of this discussion in Sunday school the other day. Uh, we kind of went to the extreme. You know, w what if it got to the point where they were forcing you to, to say, yes, you're a follower of Jesus, or, or no, you're not. And we got to the point there where if come. it's a gun to your head, what are you going to do? And Jeanette was the first one to speak up, and she's like, that's tough. But I've made that commitment. If it's at mine, pull the trigger. That's what I'm going to say. He's my Lord and Savior, and I'm proud of it. <clears throat> Amen. What he said was, you say, well, that's just on movies. It's, it, it, well, and it's happened. It happened in high school at Columbine years ago. She was asked, you still going to serve Jesus? Now, was that an Islamic terrorist group that came in? No, but they still asked the question, and she still had to respond. She responded, and it cost her physical life. These are great answers. But you got to be ready. Um, now, first and foremost, uh, uh, Eddie mentioned it. Listen, if you're a believer, then you're going in the rapture of the church. But let me tell you this. It's going to continue to get worse. Thank you, Robbie. Up to that point. And we've got to, you all have heard me preach, of course. But we all, I always preach about the tough things. There's going to be some times where we have to make tough decisions. Tough decisions are going to have to be made. And you got to make sure that you are standing and ready to make that tough decision. Okay? It's one thing to preach it. It's one thing to agree with it. It's another one to have to go through with it. 
I had a guy that worked for me at the sheriff's office. You've all heard me preach that abortion's murder. I believe that. Now, let me say this. There's room at the cross for somebody who has had an abortion. If you're in here tonight and you have had an abortion, it is a sin. However, there's forgiveness for you. Okay? So don't you think that we're the kind of folks or I'm the kind of preacher that's going to send you to hell without a way. Understand that Christ died for all of our sins. Jesus' blood covers it all. But I will stand on the fact that it is murder. I had a guy that worked for me at the sheriff's office. And didn't go to church. But they would come to me. Hold on, Shirley, I want you to answer it. One second, let me say this, and I'm going to let you. He came to me, and he had a daughter, very young, had been married a year. She had suffered her entire life. A very rare condition. And uh, very small. She probably weighs today 70 pounds. She was pregnant. And, uh, of course, the doctor immediately said, listen, having this child's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. They sat down as a family, purposed in their hearts that an abortion is not in, is not in the equation. Now, they didn't go to church, but you know what he came to me and said? He said, Shane, you told me it was a sin. And I believe what you said. And you're saying that God sees it as murder. So I told my daughter there wasn't going to be an abortion. And she agreed with me. So if it kills her, you're sure that God sees it as murder. Now, this guy didn't even go to church all the time. But he had heard what I had said about it. He was met with a decision. He made the right decision. The baby is fine now. She's fine. Praise the Lord for that. But he was ready. He was ready. She was ready to die. Are you? I'm not in here tonight going to preach. I just want to know what we're going to get into in a minute is you've got to purpose in your heart a few things. Shirley, go ahead. That's why we need pastors like you that teach us because we've got to have God's word etched on our hearts. Amen. So when they take our Bibles, we'll know it. And they can't take it away from us because it'll be in here. Amen. They can never take it away. Amen, Shirley. My generation that sat down and let them take Bibles out of schools, we didn't do a thing. We thought they wouldn't do it. My generation did it. We didn't say a word. They yeah. took, our, took the Bibles out. And, and that's what Paul was, that's what I was getting to with Paul, is this has been allowed. We've gotten pushed around. Now, listen, the, <clears throat> Jesus Christ hasn't, you know, but it's his church. So we've got to be prepared. Where I'm going with this is that we've got to be prepared to make hard choices and decisions long before it ever comes time to really have to make them. You understand what I'm saying? So look in your Bibles, Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 through 9. Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 says... In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand uh, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. Verse 5 says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Ju Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. 
For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar and to Hananiah of Shadrach and to Mishael of Meshach and of Azariah of Abednego. Verse 8, listen to me. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, I just pray that you would open these scriptures up, Father God, that you would show and, and, and let these, our folks absorb, Lord, Father, what, 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 what I believe you've shown me, Father. God, I thank you for your word. Go and be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And we'll get back to what we were talking about in just a few minutes. But when we look at the book of Daniel, when we open up the book of Daniel, uh, we immediately, our thoughts turn to great prophetic truths. That's what we think. And it's absolutely correct. When we think about prophecy, yes, the book of Daniel is the Old Testament equivalent uh, to the New Testament book of, a book of the Revelation. That's, that's very true. Uh, it is absolutely full of prophetic truths. Uh, but what I want to talk about tonight are some practical truths that are in Daniel that can teach us some very valuable lessons, especially in today, especially in this hour, especially what we're going through. Now, Daniel was a young man. Let's talk about him just a second. He uh, grew up uh, under a, a Judeo culture um, of traditional family values of the time. That's what he was used to. Uh, then, as we've read, he unexpectedly finds himself in a culture that did not share his religion, his convictions, nor his moral values. So he's a stranger at this point. Understand? He was now in a culture that was completely foreign to everything that he had ever known. Yet he's still there. He's in the middle of it. He's looking around thinking, these people are not like me. Their beliefs are not my, like my beliefs. How did this happen? Now, the reason for this, or the reason that it got to this point, was because of the Babylonian captivity. That's important for you to understand. The nation of Judah was given into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army because of their disobedience to God. We're going to talk about two disobediences tonight which got them to this point. There were two that caused Judah to be carried away into captivity. Number one is disobedience to the word of God. God told the people, we all know this story, to give the land a Sabbath uh, every a Sabbath rest every 70 years they were not cultivated uh, they disregarded God's word and it went like 490 years uh, without a Sabbath rest number two was the departure from the worship of God that's why they were taken into captivity the Jews found a strong fascination with idols and of pagan uh, pagan worship as the nations around them that sounds crazy, doesn't it? But we're going to get into that in just a minute uh, as well. Uh, they really, let me back up, they really were intrigued. They, they were really, these, the, these Jews that kind of got to the point where they said, well, you know what, that's, that's kind of neat. That's kind of interesting. It doesn't take as much sacrifice and there's a God for everything. You know, they were drawn by that type of thing. And it, you, you can sit back and say, how in the world did they do, do that? But we do the same things now because they began to worship strange gods and idols. We got to where we are today because at some point, like Shirley said a few minutes ago when she referenced her generation, at some point, we, the church, got comfortable. At some point, the church itself said, you know what, it doesn't concern me. And at that point, it didn't concern us. Therefore, it did not concern our kids then it didn't concern our grandkids. They forgot the things of the Lord. They forgot the things that they were supposed to have been taught as young believers. They forgot the things of how important worshiping God was, how important putting God first was, how important it is. And we've got to a point in society where we put anything before God and make excuses for it. I, I, I'm going to be kind of specific tonight if that's the right word. Um, and what I mean by that is this. We have so many excuses not to worship God that it's, it's sick. 
We have so many excuses of why we're not here on Sunday mornings. And, and I'm not talking, look, if there's a church that you are drawn to, that the Lord leads you, that you can serve in, and you want to be there every time the doors are open, and they are a Bible-teaching church, you go there wherever you can serve. Because I think you should think that your church is the best church. Not because of me or not because of a choir, not because of a Sunday school teacher, because he is worshiped. He's number one. That's what matters. There's no excuse not to worship him. There's no excuse not to be here. For a long time, the church got to be a show. For a long time, the church just got to be something that we did. Something that you felt good about going and giving. Uh, and then we started putting things before him. Whatever it is. I'm sorry, but no, let me back up. I'm not sorry. It's the word of God. Whatever you're putting before him, there is no excuse. You say, well, you don't under I don't have to understand. You don't have to explain to me. You don't have to tell me why you've chose not to put him first in your life. It's up to you. That's between you and him. But we got to a point to where God just became not important. He became a condiment. He came as, but kind of came, came a, a side item. Uh, uh, something that we call on when life gets hard. Something that when everything falls apart, we want to summon our God in a bottle, him come fix it, then we put him back on a shelf. It's not who he is. That is not who he is. And I hope that we can see that tonight. We see that they had disobedience to the word of God. There was a departure from the worship of God. For Daniel, his value system, his truth claims, his moral compass was repeatedly challenged on every turn. Sounds familiar for the true Christian today. If you are striving to serve the one true God, it's difficult. If you are striving and you want to be what God wants you to be in this lost and dying sinful world, it's tough. It's not going to get easier though. It is not going to get, listen to me, Christian, listen to me, believer. Comf, being comfortable is over for the believer. We may be here another thousand, two thousand years. I don't know when you don't know, but I know this. I know that many years ago, when the church and the one true God became unimportant, when we put them on a shelf, we began a decline. We find ourselves in a world now who are more concerned about a, somebody who decides a gender. Look at the news. I, and I'm not trying to be funny tonight. I, I want you to see the severity of our country, the severity of where we came, the sickness, absolutely, of where we have gone to. It's, it's a sick, sinful. I mean, it'd be another great book of the Bible. And you'd expect judgment to follow. You, if you were to read about many of our churches, about many, most people in the United States, you'd be reading, like, man, bring the wrath, God. Man, suck it down on them. Give it to them, Lord. That's what we deserve. That's where we are. But as we go forward tonight, Daniel's word. You see, and here's the thing about Daniel. Daniel's world was monotheistic. He, he worshiped the one and true God, the living God. But it had evolved, just like today, into something that we call polytheism, pluralism, paganism. You worship whatever you want to worship. Just whatever. You know, how, how often do you, do, you, do you hear, well, you know, I, I don't really believe all that said this before the one true god is not a bag of 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 trail mix you don't pick out the m&ms and 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 leave whatever those brown long things are you don't it's not like that it's all or nothing and we don't have the authority to pick what we like about who god is he is who he is regardless of what we think 
And see, that's how Daniel worshipped. But now he was in a society or a culture or an environment, rather, that was completely different. Now, and it's like, Daniel, we find ourselves in a world that has passed from a what we'll call Judeo-Christian culture to one in which, in many ways, has become anti-Christian. At the, at the least, it's anti-Christian. Do you understand that our very country desires us to be the minority? Do you understand that our very country is sick of the Christian? Do you also understand that out of 47% of the United States of America who claim to be Christian, only 66 of that 47% believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Less than that believe in the virgin birth. We've done a pretty good job at making ourselves a minority. Because at some point, those things didn't become important. And some things, people say, well, those things don't matter. Sometime, in some place, living a separated life became something that was not important. You're called to be holy. You're called to be separated. My desire for everyone in this that I could ever make contact with is to be saved. But it don't stop there. You understand? My job as the pastor of this church is not only to make sure that you're saved, but to make sure you grow. To make sure that you understand what living a separated life is. Of, of being one that understands that you can't be like the lost and dying world. You've got to be like Daniel, which we'll get into in just a minute. You'll, you'll, you've got to be like Daniel when everything around him was different. Everything around him was hard. Everything around him made him unpopular. It made him scared. It may have made him feel out of place, which he, he very certainly was. But are you out of place? Now, in here you're not. <laughs> we, I, man, we can act like Christians with the best of them. But what about your folks away from here? Are you still set apart? Have you purposed in your heart, like verse 8, that you're going to be different, you're going to be separated, you're going to be set apart? Are you just like everybody else? It's very important that you ask yourself that tonight. So let's get started. Let's look at the position Daniel was in and his response. My question to you tonight is, have you purposed your heart? Because we want to see tonight how Daniel purposed he is. Let's look at uh, verse 4 through 7. Verse 4 through 7 says again, Children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And uh, the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these uh, were of the children of Ju Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar and Hananiah to Shadrach, and to uh, Mishael of uh, Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. Now, we'll refer back to those scriptures several times. So what we see there in verses 4 through 7 is that uh, he was challenged to change. He was challenged to change. First thing was, they wanted to change their learning. It says in verse 4 that they wanted to teach the learning of the Chaldeans. They wanted knowledge of science. They wanted them to change. We live in a world that wants us to change. Do you understand? That they want our learning changed. We've got some teachers and former teachers in our congregation who are amazing, uh, amazing people. But the ones who are still teaching today, you're in a battlefield because you're expected to teach today something completely contrary to the Word of God. They want to take our children. They've done many things in, in, in society today. They've done many things uh, with, our, with our school systems uh, that completely has changed the very learning and working of a simple math problem or something like this because of one reason. They do not want the child to be able to have the ability to depend on a parent. They want to depend on the something bigger. You understand, they want to change the thinking. They want to change 
our children. Now, uh, no, 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 don't, don't hear me wrong. There's some Christian teachers, man, in there fighting the fight. They're in the battle, and they don't like it any more than the preacher does. I got them. We got them in this church. But I'm telling you, see, they wanted to change their learning. That's what they're wanting to do to us today. They're also, in verse 4, wanting to change. We see that they wanted to change their language. It says to teach the tongue. They wanted them to have a different type language. And then we look and we see in verse 5, verse 5 tells us, that they wanted to change their lifestyle. Verse 5 says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. They wanted him to change, to do away with what they've always known. They want to change the church today. They want to change families today. You see, God ordained a church. God ordained marriage. Do you understand that? But the world wants to change that. It wants to change the fact. It wants that, that, to, to completely obliterate what God established. And we allowed it. We've allowed it. You see, today, the world wants to change the church. They want to change the Christian the reason they wanted this change was in Daniel's time was so when Nebuchadnezzar took over all of Judah. You see, the reason the world wants the Christian to change so much and adapt is because our foundational beliefs are contrary 100% to what is accepted today. You realize what you're called, what you're labeled as if you stand up and be a true Christian. If you teach the Bible, if you refer to God's word. There's a lot of names you're going to get called. And it's going to affect you. And that's what I'm getting to is, are you prepared to be affected? Are you prepared for what's coming down the pipe to the Christian, for the Christian? I'm not here to teach gloom and doom because there's hope. That hope is Jesus Christ. That hope is this is not our home. That hope is we're only here for a short time. Life is but a vapor. Man, at the, at, at the trump, we're out of here. But here's the deal. What can happen is, is if you don't know what's coming, you're going to get down. You're going to get out of the fight. You're going to say, what in the world has happened? What has occurred? God's word tells us. It's told us since the Old Testament. Told us since the beginning. What is going to happen and occur? And you've got to be ready. You've got to purpose your heart tonight. So you can make the right decisions. Understand that uh, the next thing is they wanted to change their loyalty. Now this is good right here. Verse 7 says, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. And this is when he changed their names. He wanted to change their loyalty. Daniel, his name means God is my judge. God is my judge. They, wanted our, they changed it to a Belshazzar, which means may Bel protect his life. That's what they changed his name to. They were, they were trying to change his loyalty by changing his identity, by changing his name. Hananiah means Jehovah is gracious. Changed it to Shadrach, which means the command of Aku, which is a Babylonian moon god. Uh, Mishael, who is like God, is what his name meant, to Meshach, means who is like Aku, the Babylonian moon god. Azariah, his name means the Lord helps but they change it to Abednego, which means a servant of Nebo, which is a son of Baal. See, they were doing what it took to change their identities. They wanted to change who they were. They wanted to change their loyalties. Subtle little changes that mean big things. You say, well, it's just a name. Well, it's what the name meant. Do you understand that there's, that there's places across this, this, this country that the church is not called the church anymore. A, 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 a campus or, uh, if you will, a, a learning environment, things like that all across our country. They want to change little subtle things. You know, don't put church on a sign. That's offensive. I told you Sunday the cross is offensive. And we've got to stand on that. 
Just little subtle changes. Come on, preacher, it's only a name. That don't affect anything. Let's don't rock the boat. Being a Christian has always rocked the boat, and it will always rock the boat in a sinful world. The problem is there's a lot of Christians saying, sit down, don't cause a ruckus, man. You're, you're, you're getting a spotlight on us, and I'm not prepared. I'm not purposed. My heart is not ready for this. You better get your heart ready for it. That's what's important tonight. They wanted to change their loyalty, change their lifestyle, wanted to change their language, wanted to change their learning. Understand those subtle little changes, but they mean big things to God. God was very particular. He, were, he was very specific in his word. You look at the tabernacle. You look at the temple. He, he gave specific directions, everything to the furniture in the tabernacle, the furniture in the temple. It meant something, and God told specifically how it needed to be. He's a specific God. You don't have the authority to say that's no big deal. You know, you want me to tell you why? Because he's a big deal. This is his it's all his. It's his authority. We don't have the authority to change any of that. So as the world begins to try to make those same changes that Daniel was going through, we got to understand that we are challenged to change daily. Or we are challenged to change, I'm sorry, daily. The world wants us to change. We're challenged to change. There was a, a writer, his name, and many of you may know him, his name was Henry Blackaby. And he wrote this. He said, anytime God wants you to do something great for him, you will face a crisis of belief. The crisis of belief is a turning point where you make a decision or a commitment. There's no truer word spoken. Anytime God begins to do something great, you're going to have to make a decision. That decision may be tonight. It may be tomorrow. But it's coming down the pipe and the decision is, will I follow God in my life or will I follow my own desires? Ask it now. Ask yourself that tonight. Will you follow God or will you follow your own desires? Let us all answer that question. And it's easy for us to say, God, I'll follow God. But are you living like you follow God? That's it. I don't care what you say. It's not between you and me. It's between you and him. It doesn't matter what you say in here. It doesn't matter what you say when you're with your friends or when you're with your preacher or when you're with your Sunday school teacher or whether with your somebody studying the Bible. But what does your life say? Which one has your life chosen? Has it chose to follow God or is it choosing to follow its own desires? Do you want to be liked by this world? Do you want to be sucked in and lifted up and glorified by this Lord or this world? Which one will you follow? Don't matter what you say. If you're following God, you don't have to say anything. Do you understand? Your life will live that. Next, will I live my life from God's viewpoint or from the world's viewpoint? What, are, what is important to you, in other words? What is your level or your outlook on success? When have you made it, man? What are you shooting and striving for? Are you looking for success on a worldly viewpoint? Or are you looking at it from God's word? Third, will you honor God through the various stages of life? Good times and bad times. Rich and broke. Sick and healthy. Alone or popular. Being a Christian can be lonely sometimes. Working for him gets even lonelier. It can be lonely. Or are you purposed? Have you purposed your heart? And no matter what happens, no matter what comes down the pipe, I'm going to live for it. <laughs> have you made that decision? Life is a series of decisions. What we are today is a result of a decision that we made at some point in our life. You're in here tonight because you made a decision. You made a decision to come to church on a Wednesday night. You made a decision long ago that if you're a believer, that if you are saved, if you're a blood-bought believer, you made a decision because you were drawn by the Holy Spirit, you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You made a decision to be a follower at some point if you're, sa if you're saved. And that has affected you up to this point. Life is about decisions. Some of us have made terrible decisions in our life. I'm one of them. We've all done those things, and decisions affect us. But we've got to make another decision. It's decision time. 
I don't want to be the church of how it's always been. I don't want to be the church that everybody looks at and says, oh, that's just another church. I want to be the living, the church of the one true living God where he is worshiping praise. It's not about programs. It's not about the preacher. It's not about a deacon. It's not about a Sunday school teacher. It don't matter who's here, but he is uh, lifted up is what needs to matter here. That's what we've got to be about. If we intend to truly honor him. And we've got to make that decision tonight. Because what we will be tomorrow depends on what decision that we make today. Many of our major decisions, unfortunately, are made when we're young. Unfortunately. But that's the way it is. But making a commitment, it involves a decision. All real decisions, listen to me. Each real decision that you make is a heart decision. All tough decisions that you make come from your heart. And it means something. Understand that Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. All real decisions are heart decisions. We need to remember that tonight. Daniel resolved to God's principles, and he committed to God's plan. The Babylonians could change a lot of things about Daniel's life, didn't they? They changed a lot of it. They changed his home country. They changed his homeland, his name. But they could not change one thing. That was his heart. So often we hear the phrase, well, you know, they took God out of schools. They took Jesus out of schools. Y'all have heard me say it. If the kids are saved, if the parent has had brought them to church, if they have been led to the Lord, if they're blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ, you can't keep Jesus out of a school. Do you understand? Because if they're going to school, Jesus is going to the school. The Holy Spirit goes with them. And it's the same thing at your job. Same thing at your work. You say, well, I can't witness at my work. They'll fire me. I can't, I can't talk about Jesus. And they may. They might. I can give you no comfort or peace and tell you, well, don't do it there. Go across. I can't give you that. Marcus and I have talked about that a lot of times. Marcus is in an environment. His work, I, I understand. We've talked about it. But I can't tell Marcus, well, then just don't witness. I tell Marcus to witness, man, God will take care of you. That's all. And, and, and I've got to stand on the same thing. You say, well, that's easy for you to say. You'll get a paycheck I want God to provide. That's the thing. We've got the purpose in our hearts tonight. You understand that it was an individual decision that we see in verse 8. Verse 8 is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Daniel had decided one thing. He would not compromise. Would not compromise. Understand that making decisions for God are much easier. And this is what I want you to get out of this. This is where I started when we started asking the questions at the first part of the service. I'm asking you tonight to draw the line. In your heart, you draw the line. Making decisions for God are much easier if you've already drawn that line. Daniel had done that. Under no condition would he compromise. The reason that I passed the microphone around is, is I wanted to see what you thought, how far we'd go. Not for just the, the ones who spoke, but I wanted you to start asking yourself, how, how far will I go? I, it, it's, it's not murdering babies because we allowed that. We're past that point. It's, it, do, do you understand? Let's look at the largest, most money-making industry in the United States, pornography. I, I, now, I, I won't let my kids watch porn. Do you understand that what was considered pornography in the 1980s, you can get on regular TV today. Well, everybody's watching it. So we've passed that. We will submit and compromise to murdering babies. Okay, okay, let, let's check that one off. We will commit and compromise to, to, to allowing pornography. Now listen, I'm not expecting not one of y'all to march down to the Capitol and stop pornography. That's not what I'm doing. Or, or, stopping, or, or, or stopping murdering babies. That's not what I'm saying. But collectively, here's the problem. We've never truly understood the body of Christ. We've never understood the power in the body of Christ. We've never acted collectively because like I teach Sunday morning is... We can't get along long enough to do anything. That's the problems. We got to understand what unity is in the church, God's church. It's not about these things that we desire. It's not about the things that we want. It's not about us being lifted up. It's about uplifting him and him alone. Don't be in here being mad over some little something goofy. 
There's work to be done. You say, well, yeah, but you don't know how my family. Listen, that happened a long time ago. Look at the shape our country is in. There's not a purposed heart in the Christian anymore. We wouldn't be in this shape. You say, well, drugs, preacher, that's my line. I want to keep drugs away from my kids. We've passed that too. I mean, you look. Uh, you, you've got all sorts of drugs at fingertips. We've got a, a, a government that wants to legalize them. We've got government wants to do all those things. So where do we stop? Where's our line, church? Now, and, and I agree with what you said. I agree with the fact that I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ at what point? When you go stand for him? We've been pushed around like a, a kid getting bullied on a playground, man. When? When do you start standing? It's a, I understand. I get it. I say the same thing. I'm going to stand for him. When? When does it have start? When is enough enough? When do we understand God's outlook on sin? When do we understand that it's sin that hung Jesus on the cross? When? At what point? It's easy for us to say we're going to stand for him. I say it. I, I, I'm not saying your answers are wrong. I'm saying that they don't match up to our life. When do we stand for him? If you've got an answer, tell me, because I don't know either. At what point do we say, enough is enough? At what point do we say, hey, I'm a Christian. That's my Jesus that, 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 you're, that you continue to bash. That's my Jesus that you continue to put down. The one that you laugh at, the one that you scoff at. And he told us they're going to persecute us because they first persecuted him. They're going to hate us because they hated him first. He told us those things. But why do we continue to be allowed? Why do we continue to just give lip service? I'll stand for Jesus. I, if it comes that time, it has come that time. It's been here. We don't have the purposed heart. We've been making head decisions and not heart decisions. That's the problem. You see, before those temptations to compromise come, you need to decide your convictions based on God's word tonight. Because they'll, 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 they'll sprout up and pop up and just get you off guard, man. That's how the devil works. He wants to catch you slipping. And boom, he jumps up and you don't know what to say. I'm telling tonight, you need to make a line in your heart as far as I'm going. I don't care what you're going to do, put me in jail. What you're going to do, cut my head off. What you're going to do, and I know that's easy talking, but man, I'm telling you, it happened in the Bible, and I know the Bible is true. I've read it. I know what happens. What are we going to do? We'll stand for them when. I'm going to start witnessing when. I'm going to start living for him and like him when. When? When they come and bust your door open and, and get you out from under the couch and start to get granddaddy's 22 long rifle? Is that when we're going to stand up? Because they come to take something from us? Man, they took his life for you and I. They, that's what they took. Do you understand that? Do you understand? Yes, God always saw a cross, but they killed him for you and he went willingly for you and I. But man, I'm going to tell you, when they come get my guns, when they come do this, when they come get that, I ain't going. I'm standing up for Jesus. No, you're standing up for your 410. Standing up for Jesus is much more difficult, and we're behind the edge. Now, I'm not against it. I'm not against you standing up for those things. Don't hear me wrong. I ain't giving them mine either. But we're past that point, guys. You saying that you'll stand up for for. Uh, for, for, for rights of the right to bear arms, I'm for it. I, I like guns. I'm for it. But we'll stand up for those things? But we won't stand up for him? Because many of us tonight have purposed in our heart, they ain't getting this from me. They ain't taking that from me. Crucify Jesus all you want to. You know, pass laws that, 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 that just, just glorify sin all you want to, but you ain't getting my guns. Again, I'm for them. We're Christians. Do you know what that means, Christ-like? Do you know what it is? 
Because we act like we don't. To live for him? Do we understand or do we not? And I, live, I think we got the best church on the planet. I, we do, man. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not honed in and sighted in on just heritage. I'm talking about us, all of us. I love you. Don't get me wrong. But all we've done is talk. We're a bunch of talk, man. Christians just a bunch of full of hot air these days. I hear it all the time. We're going to stand up. When does it start? When, 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 why can I turn the TV on and, and, and see mess that used to, you have to get pay-per-view 15 years ago and our kids are, can sit and watch it? Why? Why, do the, why? why can my kids, why can they go to a school and a teacher tell them that no, Jesus did not resurrect. That's completely uh, 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 lunacy. You can, why? When did it get to that point? We allowed it to get there like Shirley said. So when does the standing up part, that's my question. When will you purpose in your heart, this is as far as I'm going. No further. Daniel did it. He was in an environment he didn't know. His whole life had changed. He knew that it would cost him his life. He knew that if he stood up, what would cost? But he said, I'll go no further. I purpose in my heart. He had already made the decision. You see, because he had already made the decision, then it made him easier to respond. We got to set our boundaries, draw our lines. At that point, you're ready to say no. I have a heart tonight that is purposed. Look at verse 9. Verse 9 says, now God has brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. It's a great verse. You see, God had moved with an unseen hand to change the heart of the Babylonian official. You say, preacher, that, that's awful big talk. You're talking about stand up now while we're waiting on. Understand, if we'll stand for him, he'll stand for us. That's what happened there. You see, God moved without Daniel even knowing. And, and he had already got a hold of this to, to the Babylonian. He done took care of everything. He just seen what Daniel's going to do. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? We're going into revival. March the 28th. The revival is for his church. I hope we see 10,000 people saved. Y'all know my goal is to see folks saved, led to the Lord. That's important, but it's not the only thing that's important. Praise the Lord. That, listen to me. Okay, now what? Okay, great. Praise the Lord. Greatest news we can get, but now what? Who's going to teach him or her? Now what? What do we do now? Throw them out, not teach them, not grow them in the word? What, 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 what do we do? Because here's how they're going to learn. They're going to watch all of us. They're going to watch mom and daddy. Now, mom and daddy come to church, and they raise their hands. They read their Bible, but we go home, and it don't look like church people. My goal, man, is to present Jesus Christ to as many people as I can before I die. But as your pastor, my goal is to make sure that you grow. Make sure that you understand the necessity of having a purposed heart. Understand that you know the importance of growing. Growing in God's word is so important. We talked about prayer last Wednesday, how important that is. I'm going to ask you tonight that you do purpose your heart. You, put, you say, God, I've gone as far as I'm going. I'm not asking you to go attack no government, nothing, none of that. Man, that ain't what I'm saying. You know, Jesus fights his battles different. Jesus told us to fight. We fight our battles on our knees, but we take a purposed heart to the battle. We don't allow and we don't condone a sinful nation. When somebody asks you, how do you feel about that? It's sin. Don't mean I don't love you, but it's sin. And I can't condone it. I can't, I can't go along with it. We got to get to that point. We're too afraid. We have gotten to the point to where we are so afraid of hurting people's feelings, we care nothing what God thinks. We care about everybody's feelings but God's. What does he think about it? 
What, uh, well, let me, let me clear that up. What does, what does God think about? See, what does God think about you taking a neutral position on things? Well, let me say this. He hated sin enough that he sent his only begotten son to die for it. His own son. So you tell me what you think and how you think that he feels about it. I'm going to ask you tonight that you'll look in your own heart. That you pray in your seat, in the altars, wherever. And you say, Lord, I've been pushed around. I'm not, again, I'm not talking about anything physical. I'm talking about by God's word, standing for God's word. It's going to get uncomfortable. I can assure you, if you purpose yourself tonight to live for him, tomorrow is going to be hell, okay? Total chaos is coming at you. Because when you make that decision to live for him, the devil will not like you. Many, many of us say, well, you know, the devil, he don't ever really bother me. You've never been an, an issue to him. He's got you right where he wants you. You're not a threat to him. You understand? But I, I don't know if, Robbie, in just a second, I'm going to ask if can you play something from back there? Um, I want you to ask yourself. We're coming up to revival. And, and, and we need to be praying. We've got the sign-up sheet that we'll have outside for you to sign up 10 days before revival in increments. Some of it's in the middle of the night. He's worth it. I, I just believe God's word. I believe that if we will get on our face, humble ourselves before him, then revival he will bring. I believe he can still do it, man. I believe he can do amazing things with his church. It starts here. And it starts here. We've got to understand. We've gone on long enough being tossed to and fro. It's time to purpose our own hearts. Just as Daniel did. He knew that God would come through. Just like we got in verse 9. God had done moved. And he can still move today. I know it's scary sometimes to think about being different. I know it's scary sometimes to think about stepping out, standing out. But it's worth it, guys. I remember before I was saved. I remember where I was headed. I remember what awaited me. I remember how close that I was. was in two shootings in the time before I got saved. Car wreck. I, he, he, he had mercy on me. And if you're in here tonight and you say, well, you know, that really don't make sense to me because I don't know if I know Jesus tonight or not. That Holy Spirit draws you. The Bible says, if you'll confess your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, God raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what it takes. But at that point, here's the problem. Some of us were, were ushered into the doorway of salvation and we stopped. We stopped. We've gone no further. We're still on the milk. We're still babes in Christ, man. We've got some old babies around here. It's time to grow in his work. It's time to purpose our hearts for him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word. Father, I hope it made sense. God, I just pray that uh, your spirit will move about these people. I pray that we would ready ourselves, God, for your revival. God, I pray that from tonight forward, God, that we would truly stand up for you and you alone. You are more important than all these things, Father. You are more important than everything, anything in this world, God. Reveal that to us tonight. Show that to us. Convict us to know that tonight, Lord. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You come if you need to tonight.